In this video, we will continue our tour of molecular genetics and ecology by focusing on different types of genomes. So first, what I want you to do is think about where your DNA came from. So I'll give you a little bit of time to think about this on your own first. And the answer really is, whoops, it depends, right? So it really depends on what DNA we're talking about because within us, we have different types of genomes, different regions and places within our cells that have DNA. If you're a plant, you have an extra place too. Um, but normally when we talk about DNA, we're normally thinking of nuclear genomes. So typically we think about we have a cell, within that cell there's a nucleus, within that nucleus we have all of this different DNA coiled into different chromosomes, and then on each of those chromosomes there are multiple genes. So normally we think of nuclear genomes when we think of DNA, and except for a few exceptions, which we'll come back to later, your nuclear genome, that DNA in your nucleus, is biparentally inherited. So what that means is that your DNA came from both of your parents, biparental, meaning two, right? So what that means is if we look at this example nuclear genome shown here, if we focus on this set of chromosomes, uh, hopefully you can't hear my dog, but maybe you can. He's shaking, you can hear his collar tags jingling. Um, if we focus on this particular set of chromosomes, biparentally inherited means one of those chromosomes is from the mom and one of them is from the dad. So that's what biparentally inherited means. But some DNA is actually uniparentally inherited, meaning the DNA is only passed down from one of the two parent organisms. Can you think of any examples of DNA that is uniparentally inherited? If you thought of DNA contained in organelles, then you are correct. Organelle genomes are uniparentally inherited. Again, una meaning they're from one parent. Some examples of organelles that have what we call this extracellular DNA, because it's, excuse me, extra nuclear DNA because it's outside the nucleus. One example is the mitochondria. So your mitochondria also contain their own circular DNA molecules, and that mitochondrial DNA follows a unique inheritance pattern compared to your nuclear DNA because the mitochondria is only inherited from one parent. Another example of an organelle genome is the chloroplast. So if you're a plant, you also have these chloroplast DNA. And what's really cool is they think that both the mitochondrial DNA and the chloroplast DNA exist because originally these organelles of the mitochondria and the chloroplast were these free existing organisms that were then engulfed by something else. Since they were once at one time free existing, they had their own DNA, but then when they're engulfed by other cells, they maintained that original DNA. So we have this mitochondrial and chloroplast DNA. So first we'll talk a little bit about mitochondrial DNA, which is often abbreviated as mtDNA. So if you see that, that's just an abbreviation for mitochondrial DNA. One of the characteristics of mitochondrial DNA is, like we said, it's uniparentally inherited, and specifically all mitochondria is passed down maternally. So what I have here is a little meme, I guess, um, saying thanks mom for giving me something that dad never could. So any mitochondria that you have and in most organisms is passed down from the maternal organism. Mitochondrial DNA is also very numerous. So this is an example from uh, some data from humans where the graph is looking at the number of mitochondria in different cell types. The y-axis is the number of mitochondria per cell, and then we have different types, muscle, skin, and liver. 
And we can see that it definitely varies across the different cell types. But overall, and especially in skeletal muscle, the number of mitochondrial per cell is really high. So this is a beneficial thing, as we talk, we'll talk about on the next slide, if you're trying to get a lot of mitochondria for molecular ecology studies, for instance, muscle is a really good tissue type to take DNA from because there's a lot of mitochondrial DNA present there. And in part, because they are so numerous, mitochondrial DNA are a really popular marker for ecological studies. So a lot of what we'll talk about this semester is based on studies that have been done with mitochondrial DNA. On the right here is an image of the particular circular mitochondrial genome of this species, which I have shown here because it's kind of fun. It's a deep sea fish called a globose head whiptail. Um, this is just one example um, listed in your textbook. But as I said, mitochondrial DNA is a popular marker for ecological studies. There are several different genes located on the mitochondrial genome. Some of the really common markers that you'll hear about a lot this semester, CO1, or that's short for cytochrome oxidase 1. So that's actually a part of the electron transport chain. Another really common marker is the 16S ribosomal RNA. That's another marker that's very commonly used. Um, so people will, we all see a lot of studies this semester that might use that marker as well. And so again, that marker is commonly used because it's numerous, because it is maternally inherited, it can give us some unique insight into the history of whatever population we're studying just based on that maternal side. And then if we move on to chloroplast DNA, again, if you're a plant, you also have this chloroplast DNA. In general, the using the chloroplast DNA or cpDNA for short, if you have the option in plants, is preferable to use over mitochondrial DNA markers. So in plants, mitochondrial DNA is actually very conserved, so that means very similar across different individuals of the same species. When you're picking a marker, and we'll talk more about this later, you want there to be at least some variability, meaning there are some nucleotide differences between individuals. If everything is exactly the same, it's not gonna be able to give you any information that you can use for your analysis. So in general, chloroplast DNA is preferable if you wanna use an organelle marker uh, when you're working with plants, but which parent plant that chloroplast DNA comes from actually depends on what type of plant you are, which I thought was really interesting. I didn't actually know this until I read it in our textbook. So if you're an angiosperm, which is a flowering plant, um, this is a picture from a passion fruit vine we have in my backyard. We're currently eating a bunch of our passion fruit crop this year. But if you're an angiosperm flowering plant, your chloroplast DNA is inherited from the maternal side. In contrast, if you're a gymnosperm, so like a conifer, or this is a redwood from Avenue of the Giants, your chloroplast DNA, if you're a gymnosperm, is then inherited from your paternal plant. So again, it's important to keep that in mind because when you're doing your studies using these chloroplast markers, it's important to understand what type of evolutionary patterns the data is going to give you depending on whether that chloroplast DNA came from the maternal or the paternal plant. And then lastly, originally or earlier in this video, we said that nuclear genomes are biparentally inherited for the most part with that asterisk, right? So can you think of any exceptions to nuclear genomes or nuclear chromosomes that are not biparentally inherited? So one example of that is the Y chromosome. So in organisms like us or other mammals where sex determination is determined by different chromosomes, specifically if you have a Y chromosome, you are male, those chromosomes are only passed down from the paternal organism because if you're a female, you don't have a Y chromosome, so you can't pass it on. So one example of this in 
practice or when you would want to use a Y chromosome marker specifically. Um, an example of this is with the Isle Royale wolf population. So this is a very small pack of wolves that's located in Isle Royale Park, which is in Michigan. And it's, like I said, a very small group of wolves, and so they know in general all of the wolves that are present in that population. But they noticed one breeding season, a lot of new wolf puppies, super cute, that had a new Y chromosome signature that hadn't been present before. And what they were able to figure out is that there was one single male wolf that actually migrated into the population. When that male wolf migrated into the population, he brought his Y chromosome with him. He mated, produced puppy wolves, and those puppy wolves then had a new Y chromosome genetic signature that was passed down from their new father that had recently joined the pack. So that's one example of how a Y chromosome marker can be used in molecular ecology studies.